This is the fourth in a series of messages called Beginnings based on the book of Genesis. I've told you that the Bible does not begin with Genesis, but it begins with Jesus. It begins with the empty tomb. If Jesus had not been raised from the dead after dying on the cross, his followers would have had nothing to write about. But because he was raised, at least four authors wrote and documented his life, and uh, 27 books were combined in what is called the New Testament. Those were then combined with 39 books of the Jewish scriptures, uh, which is now called the Old Testament in what we call our Bible. Had Jesus not been raised from the dead, odds are good, you would never have read Genesis. The first bo- verse line in Genesis says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The first line says, The universe didn't create you. You didn't evolve from nothing. God created you. This all began with God. And Jesus, John, one of Jesus' apostles says, through him, meaning through Jesus, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. So Jesus was right there in the beginning in creation. According to the Christian worldview, God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ the Son And the Holy Spirit created the universe. According to secularism, atheism, another worldview vying for dominance today, there is no God. All that we see evolved over millions of years. Maybe you hold this view. Since computer scientists have demonstrated that the likelihood of the earth evolving by chance mutations is essentially zero, and no scientists have been able to demonstrate higher life forms evolving from lower life forms, Christians believe that this viewpoint simply doesn't hold water. So if you're talking with a friend who doesn't believe in God and doesn't share your faith in Christ, you can say, oh my goodness, you have more faith than I do. You have faith in the religion of atheism that there is no God and everything evolved by chance. That takes way more faith than what I believe that there's a God who began all this. Christians believe God created humankind and that we are the apex of his creation. In the first chapter, verse 26, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, God, Father, Holy Spirit, in our likeness. In verse 28, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Adam said, Multiplication? No problem. Eve's beautiful. There's no sports center? Sure. Now, Adam and Eve may have had disagreements with each other. I, you know, marriage is a lot of work. I picture them uh, fighting. I picture uh, Adam saying to Eve one day, I don't get it, Eve. How can you be so beautiful yet so stupid? She said, oh, that's easy. He made me beautiful so you'd be attracted to me. He made me stupid so I'd be attracted to you. Verse 31, and God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. God made the heavens and the earth. They were gorgeous. And he placed the first man and woman in the garden to take care of it. And it was all good. So what happened? You only have to look at the news one night to see that the world is a mess. We have wars in many countries around the world. We have terrorist attacks, mass shootings, murders. There were 561 murders in Chicago last year. There were 47,000 suicides in the United States in 2017. There were 70,000 drug overdoses in the United States in 2017. Just for comparison, In World War II, the worst war in the history of this world, 408,000 American military, U.S. American military, died. 
In three years, the number of people that have died by suicides or overdoses is as many as we lost in all of World War II. It's a huge number. After Hurricane Katrina, the government reported $1 billion in government aid was lost to fraud. That's 16% of all the aid was given out. One person used 13 different Social Security numbers to secure $139,000 in FEMA aid. Eight of the numbers do not exist. So what's going on? Well, according to secularism, atheism, we are not born with a sin nature. Evil is caused by lack of education, poverty, inequity in the distribution of wealth, and corrupt institutions. If we can get everyone an education, distribute wealth evenly, that's socialism, provide everyone with a guaranteed wage, get the bad guys out of power, and put the good guys in office, we will solve our problems. According to Islam, we are sinless at birth and capable of unlimited moral and spiritual progress through belief in Allah and adherence to the Quran. Humans are born good but corrupted by non-Islamic influences. The best hope for our world is to eliminate non-Islamic cultures and to advance Islam by force, if necessary, for which there are heavenly rewards, which explains why many have been willing to blow themselves up in terrorist attacks. Christianity is the third world, third world view, attempting to shape the future of this world. Parents, talk to your kids about the differences in how these three worldviews explain the mess we are in. Whether you're a teenager, empty nester, single or married, you need to understand the differences between these worldviews and their explanation of the situation in our world. The Christian faith tells us the mess we are in is caused by sin. From the Christian faith, we learn three things about sin. One, sin is deceptive. So turn in your Bible to Genesis chapter 2, verse 8. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden. And there he put the man he had formed... The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So everything is good. Verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to work it and take care of it. Now, some people say work is caused by sin. No, work existed before sin entered the world. Work is good. It gives us meaning. Verse 16, and the Lord God commanded the man, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Some people say, well, why did God tempt the first couple with this tree in the middle of the garden? You get a picture that there may be three trees, and this one's the middle of the three. No, God says he made all kinds of trees. I picture hundreds of trees. Now, Genesis chapter 3. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. The serpent is the devil. So, who's the devil? Well, the last book of the Bible, Revelation 12, tells us, Then war broke out in heaven... Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon is the devil. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. So there was a rebellion in heaven led by Satan, and a third of the angels... And they were defeated and cast down to the earth. Now, the Apostle Paul tells us, the God of this age, that's Satan, 
has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So Satan is called the God of this age for a time. Apostle Paul also says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Our primary struggle is not against people, but against the rulers. And he lists four different uh, hierarchy of demonic forces against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Paul tells us that behind the problem of sin is the devil, who opposes God at every turn and wants to tempt us to sin and encourage us to doubt God. Genesis 3, verse 1. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals. Now, don't think of a serpent uh, as a snake uh, in the grass, but think of it as standing upright. And it was actually attractive. It's hard for me to imagine a snake being attractive. I hate snakes so much. But this was, uh, you know, before the fall. So actually, Satan, you know, appeared and was quite attractive. He was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? So the first thing Satan does is question God's word. He turns Adam and Eve's attention away from the hundreds of trees available to them and turn their attention to the one tree God told them not to touch. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. God meant that when they touched that tree, sin would enter them, enter the world, and they would spiritually die. They would be separated from God by their sin. And then the whole process of physical decay and death would begin. So Satan says, ah, you're not going to die. You're going to be fine. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. He questions God's motives. God's trying to keep something good from you. Satan tells Eve that if she eats from the tree, she will become like God. She won't need God anymore. She'll know what God knows. Her eyes will be opened. She will be enlightened. Satan has been using the lie All through history, during the Enlightenment in the 17th and 18th centuries, Satan said that man has come of age and is no longer in need of God. During modernism in the 19th and 20th century, Satan said man has little need of God, for man has learned to overcome nature. He's been to the moon and back. He's developed technology that can do all kinds of things he couldn't do before. And during postmodernism in the 21st century, Satan's lie is that man has moved beyond any need whatsoever for God. In Christ, man is God. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Adam and Eve did not start their day by saying, let's sin. Let's be evil. Let's ruin our lives and wreck everybody else's life in this world. Rather, they thought, we just want to be happy. But God's commands don't look like they're going to give us what we need to be happy. We have to take things into our own hands. We can't trust him. Seldom do people lie, twist the truth, cheat, exploit, manipulate, act selfishly, break promises, destroy relationships, or burn with resentment 
motivated, motivated by a simple desire to be evil. Rather, people say, if I obey God, I'll miss out. I'll miss out on being happy, and that's what I need. That's the justification. Sin always begins with the character assassination of God. We believe God has put us in a world of delights, but He's determined not to give them to us. We have to get them for ourselves. This is the lie of Satan. You can't trust God. The second thing we learn about sin from Christian faith is that sin has destructive consequences. Sin is a con job. The payoff is never what it promises to be. Verse 7, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. They lost their innocence. Verse 8, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? God seldom asks a question because he doesn't know the answer. He he doesn't seriously not know where they are. He answered, I heard you in the garden and was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me. Adam blames God. It's your fault. You gave me the woman. She gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. First she blames God. First he blames God. Then he blames Eve. And we've been doing the same thing ever since. We sin, we get caught in our sin, and we blame somebody else. Eve does the same thing. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate It's not my fault. It's the serpent. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you you will return. Sin resulted in pain in childbirth for women and toil in labor. From the sin of Adam, sin spread to humankind. The apostle Paul tells us, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. Here we receive the doctrine of original sin. That all people are born into this world with a sin nature. The essence of sin is not trusting God. That He has our best interest in mind. He's not going to give us what we really need. So we have to get it for ourselves. Now to understand the nature of sin, I'd like all of you, uh, if you're able, to stand up right now, and turn around and face away from me. So you can't... Some of you think, well, this is way better. You don't have to see me anymore. Now, let's pretend I'm God. That's scary. Notice you can no longer see me. If I'm silent, you don't know I'm here. It doesn't mean I'm not here. It just means you can't see me. Some people say God's hard to find. It's not that God isn't here. It's that people have their backs turned toward him. All right, you can turn around again and find your seat. When we turn away from God, 
bad things begin to happen. James, Jesus' half-brother, tells us, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. When we turn away from God and say, We don't need you, and we don't want your moral absolutes, all kinds of bad things begin to happen. In his no- novel, Brothers Karamazov wrote Fyodor Dostoevsky, if God does not exist, then everything is permitted. When secularists buried God, they buried with him the moral beliefs that protect people. There's not a lot I agree with from atheist philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, but he was spot on when he realized that a world without belief in God and moral absolutes would lead to unprecedented bloodshed. Before his death in 1900, he predicted the 20th century would be the most murderous century in the history of the world. And he was right on. In Mein Kampf, Adolf Hitler admitted that Darwin's theory of natural selection was the basis for his idea of Aryan superiority and the mass murder of Jews. So under Hitler, we estimate 10 million people lost their lives. Under the communist regime in Russia of Joseph Stalin, 30 million people lost their lives. And under Mao Zedong's communist China, 60 million people lost their lives. It's literally true. When God dies, man dies. Secularism did not work in Germany, in Russia, or in China. And it's not working in the United States. Since 1973, 50 million babies have been aborted by abortion. Now, one of the questions I received last week was about abortion, and I'll just tell you uh, uh, how, well, I didn't answer it very well last week, so I want to answer it better this week. Um, He says, how come you never speak out about abortion? Well, I want to say two things. One is, there are straight line issues and there are jagged line issues. Straight line issues are things that are very clearly Uh, spoken about in God's Word of right and wrong. Jagged line issues are ones where there could be a lot of different ways to approach something. So I don't think pastors should speak out on jagged line issues. Uh, Jagged line issues would be about uh, the country's uh, immigration policy or um, tax policy or foreign policy or trade policy. I mean, a Christian could have 10 different ways to approach that subject. What would be the best way to govern our country? Now, as to abortion, I actually put that in the, uh, as a straight-line issue. Uh, since medical science has shown us that uh, children are uh, uh, babies from conception, you know, I, I just see it as, as murder. Now, not all pastors agree with me, but uh, I, I think it is something we need to speak out against. John Adams, our second president, makes it clear in his writings that one of the reasons he recommended three separate but equal powers in government, executive, legislative, and within the legislature, he put two, House and Senate, to keep a check on each other, and judicial, was because of his belief in human nature. He was a strong Christian and embraced the biblical doctrine of sinful uh, human nature. Since he didn't trust human nature, he didn't want to put too much power in one branch of government. Now, we complain today that nothing can get done in government, but he wrote it into our Constitution. Uh, John Adams and uh, Thomas Jefferson were arguably the two brightest minds in the Continental Congress. You could throw Benjamin Franklin into that mix. Basically, the two of them wrote the U.S. Constitution based primarily on Adams' writing of the Massachusetts Constitution. Because they were very bright and the two best writers, they worked together on a lot of projects, were colleagues. But as time went on, their relationship became very contentious. Jefferson opposed practically everything Adams suggested. Adams wrote that he knew the reason. He was president, 
and Jefferson wanted to be. He said, I understand the contention. It's because of human nature. Why is the world in such a mess? Because we have turned away from God, sinned against Him, and rejected His moral absolutes. And we're experiencing the consequences of sin. Three, God provided a remedy for sin. Before we even sin, God had a plan to remedy the problem of sin. This is in the third chapter of Genesis 14. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly. Now the snake's going to crawl on its belly. And you'll eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and and hers. He's referring forward to the Virgin Mary giving birth to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He will crush your head. Christ's death and resurrection would spell the doom of Satan and his evil, and you will strike his heel. Satan will be allowed, would be allowed to stir up chaos and trouble in the world. But from the beginning, God had a plan in mind to remedy the problem of sin, the death of His Son, Jesus Christ. Apostle Paul talks about it, but because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. God provided a remedy for sin, sending His Son to pay the penalty for your sins and mine. So God could graciously grant us forgiveness. Because of His grace, anyone can qualify for it. I think you'll be surprised at some of the people you'll meet in heaven. Some people will be surprised to find you there. Bob Weber was a professor at Wheaton College in Chicago. He owned a home in the neighborhood where Jory and I own a home in Michigan. He tells about sitting with a Hindu man on a flight. They talked about the world and how things are going, and Bob asked him to give him a one-liner to express his philosophy of life. That's a great way to get into a discussion with somebody. Say, give me a one-liner, your worldview. A worldview describes, like, how did we get here? Why is the world such a mess? Is there any hope? Do, do we have a purpose? What is it? The man thought, and he said, we're all part of the problem, and we're all part of the solution. And Bob responded with his worldview, we're all part of the problem, only one person is the solution, Jesus. The man was intrigued, and it gave Bob an opportunity to share the story of Jesus. We believe the world is in a mess, and it's caused by sin. There's a lot of evil, it's caused by our sin, and it's stirred up by Satan. But we believe God has provided a remedy, His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus died on the cross for our sins so that if we believe in Him and ask Him to forgive us, He reconciles us to the Father and offers us salvation, hope in this world and in the world to come. Watching the evening news makes the world look very dark and hopeless. You, you watch it and you think, you know, things are just getting worse. It's hopeless. There's nothing better ahead. I read this last summer of a uh, honeymoon disaster. A couple arrived at their hotel in the wee hours of the morning. They had ordered a honeymoon suite with all the amenities. But when they entered their room, it, it wasn't so. It was just a tiny little room and... There were, you know, no chocolates or anything. 
sitting out, there was just a tight little toilet. And worst of all, there was no bed. All they had was a sofa that they could pull out, and it was clumpy mattress. So they didn't get the night they were looking forward to. Next morning, the stiff-necked groom stormed down to the desk to talk to the manager. He said, what kind of room is that? The manager listened to him ventilate for a while, and, and then he, he said, uh, did you open the doors? The groom had to admit that he hadn't and went back in. They opened the doors and there's this huge room with this big window with a beautiful view. There's a huge master uh, suite bathroom. And there's, ba- there's baskets of fruit and chocolate and there's a huge king bed. And they just looked at each other and said, oh. We could have had this room last night with a comfortable bed. We could have had an open window with air instead of a stuffy little room. We could have had a beautiful bathroom. We missed it all. And as I was reading this story, I I was thinking, why didn't they open the doors? I mean, why didn't they have just a little curiosity to check? Try something. Call downstairs. Do something. But it's not just a question for that honeymoon couple. It's a question for all of us. Maybe we feel like we're cramped in this world, and it's a mess, and it's hopeless. And we're thinking there has to be more. Well, there is more. The Christian worldview teaches that the world, the mess we are in, is caused by sin. But there is more. There's hope if we turn to Jesus Christ. Maybe you should turn to Christ for the first time today. Or maybe for the hundredth time. The Apostle Paul tells us, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine, according to his power, at work within us. Check him out. Show some curiosity. Ask some questions. Ask people that might need more, know more some questions. Read his word. Pray to him. Tell him what you're troubled about. Ask him for help. He has more for you. Lord God, thank you for an explanation of why this world is in such a mess. Because we've turned our backs on you, we've sinned against you. And because Satan is stirring up trouble in this world. Thank you that there's hope. That you've provided a way for us to be forgiven of our sin and have new life now in this world and a life to look forward to at the end, a life to look forward to when your son Christ comes again. I want to give you a a few seconds to talk to God. If you've never invited Christ into your life, uh, I invite you to do it right now. Tell him you believe he's the son of God and ask him to forgive your sins and come in. Or maybe you've given your life to Christ, but you're troubled. You're dealing with worries and You have a lot of stress. Tell him about that and say you want to turn to him for hope in the midst of your troubled life. You pray right now. Thank you, God, for sending Jesus Christ to die in our place, to give us hope and salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.